Okay, picking up from that last video, um, I just wanted to um, mention something. There is an error here in the open steps figure. It does not say anything in the text, so you really don't have to consider that, and I don't say it over here either. Calcium on this chart is incorrect. Uh, typically, plasma uh, and inter interstitial fluids would have more than the intracellular. So inside the cells, it tends to be lower. So this bar is too high, right? But I won't ask you about calcium on a test. I, I will ask you about the other components listed here, okay? So just wanted to do a disclaimer there. All right, so we went through this idea of how we maintain these different amounts of fluids, the composition and volumes are different in these different compartments. So in this, we, in this we look at the idea of moving, speaking of moving, there we go, moving fluid between compartments. All right, so here this should be extremely familiar with you. You've looked at this a couple times. You've looked at the movement of stuff from blood to interstitial to cells, from blood to interstitial to lymph vessels. So we're not changing the rules here. Hydrostatic and osmotic still rule, right? So I say two major factors regulate the movement of water and electrolytes, right, from one compartment to another. Yep, we've done it. So here again, we remind you that we push stuff out because the hydrostatic pressure is greater on the arterial end than the osmotic pressure, right, that we see identified here and here and here. So osmotic pressure is maintained by the presence of proteins and large molecules in the blood, okay, or indeed in any tube. So osmotic it attracts water and keeps water with it. So hydrostatic pushes it out, osmotic keeps it, brings it back, reabsorption. So somewhere in the middle of a capillary bed this is equal, these two pressures are equal and there isn't any movement. And then as we move along the hydrostatic keeps dropping, osmotic doesn't change so fluids come back. Okay. So I say here though, well, hydrostatic varied in the cardiovascular system and in the urinary system we've just looked at, all right? It is mostly stable on the cellular level. So out here, not shown on this picture, we wouldn't really see, all right? This push has really dissipated, all right? So I say out here in the cells, it's really osmotic pressure that varies. And water moves according to concentration, which you learned way back in AP1 and you weren't really supposed to forget, though it was probably foreign at that time. So again, water is attracted to the solutes, all right? So solute movement before, between compartments depends on, right, these channels and carriers. I said, so movement of solutes is passive or active. It depends on its chemistry. We examined a lot of this in class so far. I mean, we did a ton in both the urinary and the digestive. You should simply recall, again, the basis of this, this type of movement. Okay, passive or active. Active requires ATP, right? Diffusion wouldn't require a channel or gate or pump or carrier, but, right, other things like glucose that are charged do, right? So you are aware of this movement. And again, for in, throughout most of the body, water is following the solute. So if glucose is coming in, water is coming in with it, all right? So water balance exists, right, when water intake equals water output, which I kind of proposed in the last video, right? And I said, yeah, you just, you might track a little bit. You might track how much you drink. I mean, I keep track. I have a couple of bottles that I know I go through, so I have a broad idea. But I certainly don't track my output, right? So what, what are the ways that we gain and lose, right? So I said, I track what I drink, right? But I don't track what I get from foods. And I certainly can't track what I get from aerobic respiration, or what's called the water metabolism. Okay, the volume lost is, yeah, surprise, mostly urine. Some in sweating, some exhaling, right, because every time I exhale, I exhale carbon dioxide and water. And of course, we, we realized in the digestive system that we have to lose some of this with feces. We don't get it all back. So of course, if you're balanced, what's in equals what goes out. And that's not really pretty, that's not really profound. Okay, so who's, <laughs> Who or what is responsible for controlling your intake, right? I don't know if you think about this because most people say, well, I just drink ad lib, right? Ad libidum, libidum when, when I want to, right? And um, I would counter that by saying, no, you probably drink when you're thirsty, right? That's probably what a lot of people do is they wait for that. 
Well, thirst is a condition that um, is not voluntary, right? Thirst is something created by a, an imbalance in the body, right? And that imbalance has to do with plasma osmolality. Again, this word means concentration. So I say then, osmolality, ratio of solutes to water in the blood, right? Concentration. And this is maintained in a narrow range by regulating intake and output, okay? So thirst occurs when blood is more concentrated, right? Plasma osmolality increases. This is sensed by, yeah, go figure it, osmoreceptors, right? There's always a sensor. If you have an imbalance, somebody's got to figure out what's wrong, right? And say, hey, we are, or get alerted, stimulated by what's something being wrong. Sensed by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, all right? So the little cartoon here is looking at this idea. Insufficient water in the body, decreased blood volume, increased blood osmolality, right? They go hand in hand. So this increased blood osmolality, blood's more concentrated, specifically plasma, Osmoreceptors respond, and of course you have a dry mouth as well. Both of these things stimulate, yes, the controller, the hypothalamus, which creates a situation thirst, and you drink. And when you drink, you decrease plasma or blood osmolality. All right, we also remark here, we have to remember that decreased blood volume decreases blood pressure and increases angiotensin too, which also stimulates the thirst. So all of these culminate, right, come together in this stimulation of the hypothalamus. All right, so we also release antidiuretic hormone, which we've covered a lot in this course, and so I'm hoping now that it's pretty second nature that you realize that antidiuretic hormone, right, targets the collecting ducts in the kidneys and causes them to put in water channels so that water, more water is reabsorbed, right? Because remember, you have increased concentration. If you add water to it, you're diluting it, <laughs> so that's the idea, all right? And it says, as I mentioned previously, that the decreasing blood volume triggers additional responses, so you have other sensors, right? Because this is a problem, right? Having, you know, I said a narrow range you have to maintain. So baroreceptors in the body lead to increased heart rate and increased contraction, right? Because you have decreased volume, which means decreased pressure, so you gotta bring it up, right? The renin angiotensin aldosterone system, right, in, here's our increased angiotensin too, causes vasoconstriction, and we know vasoconstriction increases resistance and increases, increase in resistance increases pressure. And we also release aldosterone. So aldosterone, right, would help to recover sodiums in, uh, in sodium ions in the collecting ducts and the distal convoluted tubule. That's where it targets specifically. And why this is important, because uh, our problem wasn't sodium here, um, it, it, uh, this recovery, this reabsorption of sodium will increase osmotic pressure here, and so water will follow. And so we get, again, water back into the body, reabsorbed, and that brings our blood volume back up, because remember our problem was decrease, and we have to figure out how to increase it. I just mentioned here, how did you get to this point where you had a problem or an imbalance, vomiting, diarrhea, endurance exercises, and infants? And I say again, if this is not restored, people die from this, and, and I'm sure you're well aware of that. All right, the output here, primarily, we're talking about the kidneys, what we just got through covering in the last chapter, right? I said, since feces, sweat, and respiration losses are minimal, urine varies according to what you do. It's somewhere around, you know, one to two liters a day. And the concentration is a vast range in the concentration of urine, right? So we can have a huge range here because this is waste material. And this range is going to reflect what we're doing, right? If you've been drinking a lot of water, it's going to be low. And if you haven't, it's going to be very high, right? So concentration is highly variable and consists of excess salts and waste materials and, of course, water. If you do not produce urine, waste and excesses cannot be removed from the blood. We talked about this in lecture um, the first day when someone brought up dialysis. And you're, you're really, you have toxic waste circulating in your body. So ADH is really the main water output controller. All right, when plasma osmolality is low, right? In other words, we, we need to know what that means. It means your plasma is dilute. It's not very concentrated. ADH decreases. We don't want a lot of it around, right, because it's an anti-peer. When it's high, 
ADH, right? So when plasma osmolality is high, ADH is increasing, all right? And again, recall that it is working here on the kidneys, specifically the collecting ducts, to bring back more water. All right, electrolyte balance. So, yeah, we have, we're looking at these separately, though, again, we, we know that there's some interdependence. So, balance exists when the quantities of electrolytes the body gains equals those lost. All right? So, how do you monitor these? All right? So, um, well, I'll, I'll be honest, some of them are monitored, the most important ones. Other ones, it's kind of, um, it's not so specific, right? Uh, so I list here the ones of greatest importance, sodium, potassium, calcium, and of course we know chloride follows sodium. So these three right off the top, right? We know and have seen these through many chapters by now, and, and we know why they're important, right? And of course phosphates go with calcium, so we've got these two by association. And then bicarbonates, we have looked at that in the respiratory, and we'll continue to look at it here because this is a very important buffer in our blood. And of course, hydrogen ions, I'm going to add here since that has to do with acid-base balance. Okay, so your electrolytes enter through the digestive tract, all right? That's where you get most of them, right? They're coming in in the foods and fluids that you take in daily. They leave through urine, so it's very much like what we did with water, right? And some sweat. Again, their, their jobs, nerve excitability, yep, sodium, potassium, calcium. Endocrine secretion, yeah, they're going to help us, right, determine and, and allow us with endocrine secretion. Membrane permeability, this is especially calcium, all right? And we saw that when we talked about the nerves and neurotransmitters. And buffering bodily fluids, so that's really bicarbonate's role, all right? And, of course, foremost, these electrolytes are controlling the movement of fluids between the compartments because water is going to follow these. That's the osmotic pressure we talk about. All right, so this is a reference. I mean, I said there's tons of tables in here for reference. So this is, this is very nice just to, you know, example, where do we find these in what amounts, okay? So we've got plasma, we've got the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, and then we have urine. So these would be waste, all right? So sodium, and, and you see that these are highly variable because this depends on how much you really took in. But these are very tight ranges. Okay, and they have to be. Potassium's a little bit larger range here, but they have to be. So that's the homeostasis. So we take in a mixture. You guys measured the sodiums in your um, dietary recalls, and your chlorides probably did come with those sodiums. Uh, I didn't ask you. And calcium you measured. You didn't measure these other ones. But again, there's a balance. Okay, you don't have to know this on a test or anything. Again, this is gives you an idea of what we're shooting for, right? And of course, any excess is going to end up in the urine, right? And I said again, usually bicarbonate is conserved, but bicarbonate will increase in the urine if you have alkalosis, okay? So, oops, sorry about that extra <laughs> decimal there. All right, so here we're going to go through each one of these. Um, so I might go ahead and stop for a moment here and pick up the each of the individual electrolytes on the next video.